did want to say one or two words about Rena. So it's, it was just shocking to me when Richard mentioned this is the 20th anniversary of, of the conference and actually the 20th anniversary of her passing. She passed in, I think, June of 2000, if I'm not mistaken, Bill. I was a faculty member at USC at the time. Uh, Rena had come here, I believe, directly from her PhD at MIT with Bill. She taught on the USC faculty for eight years. She won the uh, Distinguished Teaching Award in this school eight years in a row. As Bill said, she published a couple of really nice papers in JUE and was very active as a researcher. She taught a, uh, uh, the core market analysis course in the MRED program and it was very popular, well, well received course. And she was stricken down, you know, in, you know, in her very early, sudden. very sudden, very quick, uh, very deadly case of cancer. She was in her young, early 40s. So it was, it was shocking. It, it was tragic in a way. And uh, we, we put this conference together to honor her memory. And uh, I'm just delighted to be here. Thank you for the invitation and also uh, Thank you for continuing to uh, remember her. I'm going to entertain you with a, a piece of research that is uh, very incomplete. It's work in progress. It's very new. It's, it's not just that the estimates are, are not finalized. It's big parts of the estimation don't even appear. But anyway, uh, if you uh, permit me, I'm going to continue to go forward, and I would be um, delighted with any sort of uh, feedback on the paper of any sort. So uh, with no further ado, uh, my co-authors are Donnie ben Shachar and Rani Golan, who are at Tel Aviv University. I, I'm uh, undercover at Tel Aviv University as well. I've been a f visiting faculty member there for about a decade. Uh, early in my career, I was a faculty member at one of the Israeli universities. And if, and since, that time have been working on Israeli data and on Israeli topics. Uh, this is the second paper I've written on issues that relate to the West Bank, where the idea of West Bank, this is the West Bank of the Jordan River, and I'm going to show you a little geography uh, momentarily. First paper I wrote was, oh God, I think it was in the 1980s, but it had to do with Palestinian outmigration from the West Bank, and this has to do with Israeli immigration to the West Bank. And basically what's going to go on in this paper is I'm going to talk about uh, and test uh, competing hypotheses that pertain to that population inflow, one being ideological, another being a religious, and a third being non-ecclesiastical, simply the mundane dimension of economics, and in that regard, housing. That's kind of what, what the paper is about. So I don't know how many of you are uh, nuanced in this particular issue of uh, Israeli geography and geography of uh, the Palestinian territories and all the rest, but I, I think it's fair to say that there's a little bit of uh, controversy surrounding uh, this particular topic, uh, Israeli settlement to the West Bank. Uh, the Israeli government uh, came to control the West Bank in June of 1967 at the, uh, when ceasefire was declared at the end of the June 1967 war. Uh, so Israel's been in the West Bank now a bit over 50 years. Um, there's there's a, lot of, a lot of attention to population flows to and from the West Bank, whether they be Palestinian flows out of the West Bank or Israeli flows into the West Bank. You know that Trump just offered a plan with respect to the future of the West Bank and the future of the Palestinian entity. Uh, that plan carves all the Israeli settlements in the West Bank into Israel proper. Uh, and there's some residual area there for a Palestinian entity. Uh, so, you know, be it the US government, be it the Israelis, be it the Palestinians, be it uh, neighbors in the Arab world, be it the EU, lots of people are interested in what the Israelis call facts on the ground in the West Bank. Uh, back in the day, where the day is June of 1967, when Israel, when there's actually a ceasefire and, and Israel's actually in the West Bank, the initial settlements were few. 
They were uh, sparsely populated, and they were basically small agricultural communes, which are called kibbutzim, and they were along the Jordan River. They were essentially defensive outposts trying to secure the border with the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, which is the East Bank, the other side of the, the Jordan River. Subsequent to that, there was a rise in settlement activity that pertained to uh, Jewish ideological interests in the West Bank that had to do with Jewish settlement throughout the land of Israel, Jewish access to holy sites in the West Bank, and this sort of thing. And that's gone on for quite a while. And, and numerous sort of biblical Jewish sites in the West Bank. And then what's not fully appreciated by this story is that there's actually something extremely mundane going on that relates to the field of urban economics that has nothing to do with religion, nothing to do with ideology, and very little to do with politics. And that's simply that housing's a hell of a lot cheaper a few kilometers over the line in the West Bank. And, and that's kind of one of the thematics of the paper, and this is what we're going to get to. But in terms of, you know, sort of the anecdotal motivation to the story that we're going to tell, these are uh, three quotes we picked out, two coming from the Israeli press, one from the Wall Street Journal, where if you see the first quote, which is 2019, quote, just because I live on the other side of the green line, and by the way, the green line is a real sort of store, the green line is the line of the 1948 armistice between Israel and the Palestinians that I'll get to momentarily. But the Green Line is a real thing. Everything to the east of the Green Line is the West Bank. The Green Line's kind of a, a neutral term that, that everybody can use to talk about geography because it, it doesn't involve everybody's sort of favorite way of describing the area. So just because I live on the other side of the Green Line doesn't mean I'm here for ideological purposes. Rather, I'm here for economic and quality of life differentials just 10 minutes from uh, the suburbs of Tel Aviv. And I'm going to come to geography in a minute, so you, the geography is really going to come alive to you. Um, another settler mentioned, my popul the population of my settlement is not extremist. The vast majority is secular. And in the Wall Street Journal, a third commented, we came here because it's easier to buy, where easier to buy really is sort of translated into it's a lot cheaper. But anyway, um, what we're going to do here is we're not doing politics, we're not doing polemics, we're not talking per se about our views of the conflict or what our preferences are with respect to uh, uh, any sort of resolution of the conflict. We're writing a paper which is simply positive economics. We're taking, uh, we're, we're gathering appropriate data. We're doing something that I believe no one's ever done with this topic, which is to just do positive economics. And you guys know what I mean by positive economics. Okay. So uh, in other words, there are not just small literatures, but decades of literature on household location choice. We all know about that literature. Some citations of that literature are, are even up here on the board that pertain to the application of those models to Israeli data. So there's even a non-trivial uh, uh, academic and scientific literature in Israel that relates to models of household location choice. We're looking at the usual economic factors, be they uh, cost of living differentials, house price differentials, workplace access, quality of life, et cetera. So again, as I mentioned earlier, question number one is sort of, uh, the role of economic factors relative to ideology, relative to religion. And question number two uh, relates to a literature that I'm going to get to momentarily, and that is whether economic impetus or, or economic factors are mediated by belief systems. And I'm going to talk about the belief systems that come into play as relate to the West Bank. And, and of course, uh, we'll get to some of the imp implications of all of this for for policy. Now, this is uh, uh, the literature on belief heterogeneity in household decision making. So if you look to the finance literature today, if you look to the poli-sci literature, uh, you're going to see uh, some popularity to this idea that variability in worldview, in belief system, or whatever can mediate household response to economic stimuli. 
So I have some colleagues at UCLA, uh, Carlin Langstaff, Longstaff, et cetera, that have written about trading and returns in financial markets and the idea that when investors uh, hold different models of the world, you can see differential outcomes here. We have very significant literature in political science that talks about belief divergence. And we also have literature in finance and elsewhere in behavioral economics that really gets directly at this idea of religious belief and how religious belief uh, affects investment and financial outcomes. So we're slotting this paper in some respects right into this literature, okay? So this paper is gonna be about how religious belief and, and ideology affect economic outcomes. Now, a couple of motivating factoids. We counted since 1967, 126 <coughs> settlements have been established on the West Bank. Uh, in 1967, there was zero Israeli population in the West Bank. Today, there are 400,000 Israelis in the West Bank. And what we did is we, we took those settlements and we stratified them by worldview or belief. And the way that we stratified them by worldview and belief was on the basis of very extensive, very micro-based voting records from national elections. And if you've watched what's going on in Israel recently, they've had three national elections in the last year. So we have a lot of data going back because governments come and go in Israel. They rise and fall. So they're voting fairly often. And we basically take belief and we create three groups. Group number one is uh, you know, straight up and straightforward, that would be non-ideological uh, secular Israelis. Okay, many of those left-leaning. Okay, so Israel is a political spectrum, just like every other country, of people that are very interested in se se settling the territories and people that will never set foot in the territories because they're ideologically opposed to what's going on there. So you have this whole spectrum. So one group are the non-ideologues, the secular. Another group are the ultra-Orthodox religious. Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this group, but if you go to Brooklyn or if you go to here and there, you're gonna see uh, very pious Orthodox Jews who wear long black coats and uh, cover their head, and the women are dressed extremely modestly. This is a, this is a pious population. It's a, a very religious population, and they also, their, their number one priority is to live in a pious Orthodox community. It's not to live in the West Bank or Israel proper. And if you ask them, uh, that, that first consideration is far more important. And for that matter, they prefer to be around their major holy sites in Jerusalem relative to the West Bank. So they're, you'll see the results momentarily. They're kind of indifferent with respect to the West Bank. They could be on the moon. They could be in Saudi Arabia, they could be in the West Bank, they could be wherever. That's not really the issue for them. The issue for them is to be in a pious, homogeneous religious community. And by the way, I did something extremely odd in this research that economists rarely do, which is I, I spent a day driving around settlements in the West Bank last summer and doing actual field research where you know, I tried to calibrate the data with what was going on on the ground. And I went into one of these uh, ultra-Orthodox settlements, and it's, honestly, you have no idea where you are, except that you're in an extremely pious, homogeneous community. Okay, so that's group number two. And group number three, we call by the name, kind of, uh, national religious. Not, not ultra-Orthodox religious, but national religious. And these are the ideologues. These are the people who believe that uh, the ancient biblical land of Israel includes the West Bank, that this is where Jewish holy sites are, that Jews are supposed to be here. These are the people who have an ideological imperative to be on the West Bank. So those are the three groups. And we say here, so once we look at all the election data and stratify the settlements, 126 Israeli settlements, 48 are non-ideological, seven are, are ultra-Orthodox religious, and the remainder are national religious. And the interesting part of the story, which I'm gonna show you momentarily with respect to geography, is that many of the settlements are, are very close to the major commercial, cultural population centers of Israel. They're close to Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. So that's another, uh, another interesting part of the story. 
So I've already articulated the research questions. We want to know how, in and of themselves, economic, ideological, and religious factors affect uh, population moves to a conflict zone. We want to know about whether divergence of worldview or ideology affects response to economic incentives associated with those moves. The application is to a quaint uh, story that no one's uh, thought about much, which is uh, population moves to settlements in the West Bank of the Jordan. And uh, we, we look for that mediation across worldview. We do what we say uh, we were going to do, which is that we take this very uh, high frequency and very uh, local election data, polling station data. We stratify uh, origin localities, which are localities uh, west of the Green Line, which is inside Israel proper, by uh, worldview, according to these three stratifications. We stratify uh, settlements according to that worldview. Uh, we go out and we run various models. We're going to run aggregate uh, directional place to place migration models, logistic models that are uh, sort of log odd, odd models that I'm going to show you momentarily. And we also run individual level Cox proportional hazard models. So we do the analysis at a couple of different levels. We basically show the importance of economic opportunity in the form of lower housing costs two population moves to the territories. We show how those results are mediated across national, religious, and ultra-Orthodox uh, uh, households of viewpoints. Uh, we also show that, in general, there's higher propensities to move into the territories, into the West Bank, if you're national, religious, or ultra-Orthodox. And we do this, again, by way of uh, survival analysis, as well as through um, more aggregate study. Now, if, you're, if, if, if I could digress and just give a geographic orientation for like a few minutes, is that okay? Not to, uh, okay. We all love maps here. Yeah. Okay, so forget about, these two are the same map and the scaling, the, the, all the, the dots inside all have to be reworked because obviously it's not working for you. So just, just look at the, the left here. This is a picture of Israel today in the West Bank. Again, the green line here is a demarcation of the West Bank. The green line is the armistice line from the ceasefire in 1948. Uh, before I go further with that, uh, this is the west coast of Israel. So this is the Mediterranean Sea. This is the border with Egypt. Everything down here is the Sinai Peninsula. Everything east is the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. Up here is the Golan Heights in Syria. And up north is Lebanon. Way down here, there's a little peak of Saudi Arabia. Uh, basically, I'm going to give you a, a history of the conflict in two minutes, OK? Here's the story. Uh, the Ottomans ruled this area through the end of World War I. And in the course of World War I, there was conflict between the Ottomans, who were aligned with the Austro-Hungarians and the Germans. On the one end, they were called the Axis powers and the Allied powers that included England, France, etc. cetera. Uh, there were major battles for control of this area. There was a very difficult battle for the British at a place called Gallipoli that you've probably heard about. And there were a bunch of Australian and New Zealand caval cavalry who were shipped from Gallipoli to Alexandria and Egypt, rode their horses through the Sinai in major battles with the Ottomans. Here, this black dot is Beersheba, and here, this white area here is Gaza. They were led by a general by the name of Allenby, and if you go to Tel Aviv or Jerusalem today, you're going to see an Allen Allenby Street, which uh, commemorates the fact that he marched his troops up the main street in Jerusalem as the Allied powers defeated the Ottomans. From the end of World War I through the end of World War II, the British administered this whole area. This whole area was called Mandatory Palestine, where the word mandatory came from the notion of a British mandate given to the British by the, by the precursor to the United Nations, the League of Nations, for purposes of administering this area. During the period between the wars, population is, in the area is growing. Jews are migrating. Uh, particularly uh, in the context of World War II and genocide in Europe and all the rest. Palestinians are migrating in. There's, there's fiscal capital and financial capital that's coming into the area, in part because of the Jewish migration. There's economic development in the area. And you basically get to a story where you have two people, one piece of real estate, and conflict. Okay? 
So that, the conflict becomes uh, untenable for the British, and the British say now to the United Nations, uh, we're giving the mandate back. The UN votes in 1947 on a plan to create two independent autonomous nation states in the area of mandatory Palestine, one a Palestinian state and the other a Jewish state. That proposal passes in the UN. The Jews rejoice and declare independence and declare the modern state of Israel. And the Palestinians say, we don't like that, we don't accept that idea. And the Palestinians, together with neighbors in Jordan and Egypt and everything, attack. So Tel Aviv's bombed by the Egyptians, yada, 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 yada. And there's a war. The war is called the 1948 war. The Israelis call it the War of Independence. Everything in the Middle East has, uh, uh, I, I'm trying to stay in, in uh, neutral language here. So there's a war. And at the end of that war, uh, this is what the border looks like. The West Bank only comes into being as a consequence of that war and the consequence of the drawing of the Green Line, which is, again, the ceasefire or armistice lines at the end of that war. So between 1948 and 1967, the West Bank here is part of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. This eastern border of the West Bank is the Jordan River, and on the other side of the Jordan River is the East Bank, which is in Jordan. So this is all Jordan, but conflict continues. Conflict ensues in 1956, again in 1967, and at the end of the 1967 conflict, Israel takes control of everything up to the Jordan River. So now all of a sudden, Israel uh, controls the West Bank, the sparse agricultural settlements, the, the, the small uh, in number settlements and small in population centers are here. This ribbon of land right at the border is called the Jordan Valley. That's where the Jordan River is. And again, not much was going on there. What you see here is this black dot is Tel Aviv. This black dot is Jerusalem. The, the distance between here, USC, and UCLA is 10 miles. The distance between Tel Aviv and the Green Line, I didn't even touch it, I just looked at it. <laughs> the distance between, between Tel Aviv and the Green Line is, is about the same distance. It's about nine miles. So you can jog it on a good day. So what I'm trying to say through this extraordinarily long-winded uh, discussion of geography is that these, if you look at settlements, there's a whole bunch right on the Green Line. I live 33 miles from UCLA. These settlements on the other side of the Green Line are within easy commutes of the Tel Aviv metro area. The Tel Aviv metro area is the one superstar city in Israel. It's, it's where all the high tech is, it's where the beach is, it's where all the nightclubs are, it's where all the good food is, it's you know yada, yada, yada. Uh, secular, cultural, beach. So there's amazing investment in connectivity because those roads have made... So the story of the West Bank is there, there's not a lot of work out there. The work's in Tel Aviv, the work's in Jerusalem, so people are commuting. But uh, what I'm trying to convey in the most long-winded way imaginable is that these are, are not even exurbia suburbs. They're just suburbs of uh, major metropolitan areas in Israel, for the most part. And a lot of the settlements right here on the Green Line are secular, non-ideological. These, these are not people that, where God told them to be there. They're there's just- no physical barrier. How would you know that you enter? Well, there's checkpoints and stuff like that. But in the case of some of these settlements, you get on a freeway that looks like the 405 and you just drive and you're there. So uh, uh, there, there, there are some controls. For example, right now, um, right south of Jerusalem is, right, just 10 minutes south of Jerusalem is a place called Bethlehem. And uh, the Israeli government just, they, there was a, a group of South Korean tourists in Israel that went to all the Christian holy sites in the West Bank and were all infected with coronavirus and Bethlehem was just closed today because of high incidence of coronavirus in Bethlehem. But anyway, yeah, these distances between all these places are, are really, really, really small. I mean, I was driving around the West Bank last summer. It was like, you know, LA at 5 p.m. It was just a lot of people. 
a lot, lot more mixture of populations than you think. So that's, that's kind of the basic story. The basic story is a lot of settlement infrastructure, some of it completely secular, right within the metro fringe of the major job markets in Israel. There isn't, you know, uh, Jews and Palestinians can live in the same town, even in the same apartment building, et cetera, inside Israel. But in the West Bank, they don't live in the same places. So that the major Palestinian centers are on a north-south vector, north and south of Jerusalem. So north of Jerusalem is Ramallah and Nablus, and south of Jerusalem is Bethlehem and what's called Hebron. So that's that. That's kind of in the center of the West Bank. The east side of the West Bank, again, is kind of a, a desert area. It's kind of an arid area. It's Jericho in the south and et cetera, if you've ever been there. OK, so we write about all these things. That was sort of a, anyway. Here's the salient point. It's here in, in bold, it comes straight out of the paper. What began as security-related and religious ideological settlement of the West Bank post-1967 evolved over time into movement of middle-class Israeli households to affordable areas just east of the Green Line and proximate to the major employment centers in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. So this comes from the Israel Central Bureau of Statistics, which is the equivalent of the US Census. And you know, this is uh, a reliable entity. In fact, all of these statistics for the Palestinian Authority come from the same entity. They use it as well. And uh, it shows the growth in uh, settler population in the West Bank, which roughly speaking by 2015 was on order of magnitude of 400,000 people. Now here, this slide just says, that we went to all this hassle to take all this voting data, small area, blah, 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 high frequency, and to stratify settlements and settlers and locations in Israel proper by belief system. And after we did all this work, we went to an NGO, which is sort of a, a left-leaning NGO that monitors settl settlement activity in Israel called Peace Now. And they had done all this thing, and they, they came to the same results as we did without all of uh, this data that we utilize. So anyway, we have uh, a corroboration of sorts with respect to our allocation. Now, one thing that um, is nice about working in an environment where uh, you know, there are limitations on data, but also opportunities with data, we, have, um, we don't have a sample of house price transactions in Israel, we have the universe of house price transactions. And we have that universe, and based on that universe, we can estimate quality adjusted house price indices for whatever geography we want and over, over this period of time. So here we've estimated indices for the major metro areas in Israel, Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, as well as for settlements in the West Bank. This black line, <coughs> no one's ever drawn that black line before. Nobody had a clue, uh, seriously, what's going on here. So these are quality adjusted house price indices for small area geographies in Israel. And this dotted line here is another Israeli phenomenon called the periphery. The periphery is in Israel proper, but it includes in the south this vast arid, uh, relatively unpopulated zone called the Negev, which is right on the border with the Sinai. and includes in the north what's called the Galilee also not very densely populated going up towards Lebanon and Syria. So what do, you, what do you take away from this? You take away three or four things, all of which are pretty interesting. Firstly, very uh, uh, salient house price differential, quality adjusted between the settlements on average and the major metropolitan areas in Israel. Secondarily, uh, settlements are actually more expensive than uh, Israeli towns in the periphery. And thirdly, the differential widens over time. And fourthly, the fact that housing got very, and still is, extremely unaffordable in a place like Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv's really hot. I mean, lots of, everybody in Israel wants to live in Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv is bursting with activity. And what you see here is during the years when the rest of the world was having a egregious housing downturn, house prices were going up in Israel. The governor of the Bank of Israel at the time, Stanley Fisher, was, uh, very astute in guiding Israel through that particular period that didn't buy subprime mortgage-backed securities, et cetera. 
the country was the first to tighten monetary policy after the crisis. So anyway, this gap widens. That's the first thing you see. So now we do exactly the same thing I just showed you. We, we created quality adjusted house price indices using the universe of transactions for settlements in the West Bank by settlement type. Again, nobody's ever done this. So we have our non-ideological, non-orthodox. That is the, uh, the gray line, top line, uh, all settlements. And then the ideological settlements, uh, the thing you have to understand is that these ideological settlements are small, they're remote, they're not very viable, and they're not very popular. They're filled with ideologues. Whereas the non-ideological are the, the big places close to the green line that are just, and by the way, the other thing I should say about the West Bank, it's really beautiful. It's, it's kind of, it's very attractive. It's kind of rural, pastoral, hills. It's, it's a nice place to live. Anyway, what you see here is that relative to Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, you've got a very hefty house price differential going, quality adjusted relative to, uh, say, the ideological settlements. So here's, here's another chart that relates to just the time frame of settlement establishment. I don't know what my... Uh, uh, this is one of my co-authors was thinking, but he put the right wing people in blue and the left wing people in red. So uh, that's confusing right there. But Begin, <laughs> Shamir, Netanyahu, Sharon, those, that's all the right wing ideologue people. And the left wing, Robin, Perez, uh, Barack, Omer are, are in red. But anyway, what do you see here? What you see here is actual establishment of settlement ceases more or less by the early 1990s. That doesn't mean that settlement construction ceases because there's a lot of densification and, and creation of housing in the settlements during this period. So by settlement, you can't mean neighborhood? No, no, these are actual established localities. Okay, so that they can be cities of 50 or 60,000, okay. or they can be smaller villages, but, but they, are, they are little bits, and they're, each one is a San Marino or a, Pasadena or whatever, they're all local places. Okay, so uh, we have data sets here. I think I've alluded to the data sets and I'm, I'm way behind, so I gotta get going. The universe of all housing transactions, so we get the quality adjusted house price indices. Uh, the characteristics of all localities that in, enter into our regressions, including the settlements. The, all of the election data that we use to characterize belief divergence and a, a very unusual panel that was created for us by the Israel Central Bureau of Statistics. So we have been running our models in the equivalent of a census data room in Israel. And somehow I was allowed in one of those rooms. I didn't really quite get what was going on, but, but uh, it's, it's kind of, you know, it's the usual protocol for getting into a census data room. Okay, so we got all these summary stats, no time for that. Uh, the first thing we do is we try to answer an extremely simple question. How much more expensive is housing in Israel than in the West Bank, quality adjusted? And this is just a first cut at this. And what we did here is we took the green line, we established cu couplets of localities within about three or four miles of one another on either side of the green line. And we measured average quality adjusted house prices in each of those couplets. We had like 80 or 100 couplets. We took the average overall, et cetera. The bottom line is, if you're on the Israel proper side of the green line, relative to th three miles away in the West Bank, your housing quality adjusted is gonna be about a third more expensive. No one, no one had ever computed this previously. That's the answer to that. So what's the first set of models that we run? We run models that are called polytomous logistic models. These are aggregate uh, log odds directional migration models. So we're talking about log probability migration from origin I, where I origins are only in Israel proper, to destination J, where J could be in Israel or the West Bank at time T, relative to the probability of staying, where we're, regre we're regressing that in this panel on vectors of economic and amenity characteristics in I and J, uh, proxy for the cost of moving, a vector of household traits that are associated with propensity to migrate, our characterization of belief, beliefs in the origin locality based on our voting data, whether it's national, religious, or ultra-Orthodox, or secular, 
And we also have a dummy variable as to whether the destination region is a settlement. And in the copy of the paper that you all might have seen, where we also estimate the model for settlements stratified by ideology. So we can do both, both of those things. Got a massive regression results here that uh, have to do with different specifications of the model. And because it's hard to look at in this way and really say anything about the quantitative salience of the results, let alone the statistical salience, because you've got you've to add up base case and interactive terms and multiple interactions, et cetera. Because of all that, we did calibration and simulation off of this model. And I'm going to show you just a couple of pictures that relate to calibration and simulation. So we took the sample and we calibrated so it fit that actual Central Bureau of Statistics population flow into the West Bank that I showed you earlier. And then, and then we started to play with the model. So here's, here's a couple of early things. And I'll just run through a few of the simulations and then I'm going to stop. Uh, Okay, this is the time frame of our analysis. In our analysis, something like 240,000 Israelis moved to the West Bank. And based on their divergent belief systems, I can tell you that about 110,000 were secular, non-religious, 67,000 were national religious, and 65,000 were ultra-Orthodox. So that's all we're saying there. Now this simulation, I kind of like, and you can decide whether you like it or not. This is kind of an embodiment of the Trump plan for the West Bank. What, what do I mean by that? In this simulation, we erase the green line. And what do I mean by erasing the green line? We take any, we take, when we have a destination settlement categorical term, we set it to zero. We set to zero that term in any interaction of destination settlement. And that effectively treats the West Bank destinations as if there are any other locality in Israel. It takes away the distinction with respect to security or with respect to basically anything else. So we erase the green line and we simply ask the question, if the world looked like the Trump plan, in other words, all the settlements are carved into Israel proper, and in fact, if this had been going on from the time frame of our analysis, how many people would be in the West Bank? And the answer is that there'd be 366,000 people in the West Bank relative to 250,000 in the West Bank. In other words, the, the distinction of the green line, the uncertainty that relates to the green line, the security features and the ideological features and everything else that relate to that distinction are worth about 115, 120,000 migrants uh, into the West Bank. So, so uh, the next thing we do is we say, well, of those 240,000 people that moved to the West Bank, how many moved in a case where quality adjusted house prices in the West Bank were lower than in Israel? And the answer to that question is 175,000 of the 240,000 moved from a, an area of higher quality adjusted house prices to an area of lower quality adjusted house prices. And then we simulate off of this house price differential. We say the first what if is what if the location inside Israel, the location uh, origin locality, what if house prices were 10% higher there? And what if 10% uh, house prices there were 10% lower to begin to sort of uh, get a sense of what's going on? And if house prices are 10% higher, uh, inside Israel relative to the uh, destination of the West Bank, you're going to get 14% more people shoved into the West Bank. In other words, housing, was, housing supply was, and this was sort of the question Bill was asking, there's a central authority, a regulatory authority in Israel called the Israel Lands Authority that controls development, uh, new, develop a land inside of Israel. I'm not talking about the West Bank at all. And housing became very expensive in Israel, and, and a way for the Israel, say you're a right-wing Israeli government and you want Israelis in the West Bank, just keep housing expensive in Israel. And this is what you get 15% more people going into the West Bank. On the other hand, if there's been a lot of, of housing construction inside Israel now, a ton of housing construction, a ton of new housing supply, and if house prices drop by 10%, in the inside Israel origin relative to the destination, you're going to get 57% fewer migrants in the West Bank. So the results are asymmetric. Uh, 
across these two scenarios. But you see that, you know, if, 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 if housing becomes more affordable inside of, of Israel, people are not flocking to the West Bank. This is the last thing I want to do, and then I'm going to refer to the Cox Proportional Housing Model, and then I'm going to be quiet. Um, this is kind of, this last simulation is really kind of in the spirit of the paper. Why? Because what we're doing here is we're simulating off of belief system for different pieces of the population. So on the left hand side, we're simulating the ideologues, the people that want to be in the West Bank that have an ideological reason to be there. And we start with what's called zero, zero here. What zero, zero means is that in the origin locality, nobody votes for the ideological parties and nobody votes for the religious parties. In other words, zero, zero represents a purely secular, non-ideological, probably left-leaning locality in Israel. And you ask in that case, who's going to the West Bank given the existing ratio of prices? And the answer is very few on order of magnitude of, and, and some of these non-ideologues, as I said very early on in the talk, may actually have an aversion to being there, not just indifference. On the other hand, if we push the share of people that vote for the ideological sort of right-wing populist party up to 50%, bingo, you get Firstly, given the existing ratio of prices, you get 400,000 people in the West Bank. And if you cheapen, excuse me, if you make housing in those origins 10% more expensive relative to the West Bank destination, you get 600,000 uh, of those ideologues in the West Bank. And the bottom line here is you get a lot of variability in response to economic incentive by belief system and across definition of beliefs as indicated on the horizontal axis. We do the same thing here for uh, uh, ultra-orthodox. You see much less response. And then what we do is we run this Cox proportional hazard model at the uh, uh, individual level. We test many of the same things. We get many of the same results. And now I'm done. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Gabriel, for um, giving me this chance to read this really amazing and interesting paper. And then thanks, um, Jorge and Richard, for giving me this opportunity to present, um, to discuss this amazing paper. So as we, um, as um, Professor Gabriel went through, this paper is about how religious belief and national ideological worldview affect response to economic factors amongst Israeli West Bank settlers. So. Um, there are three types that this paper is looking at, um, non-ideological, ideological, and ultra-orthodox settlement. And then um, due to the time limit as well as um, he's, is the paper is still um, trying to find the proper estimations, um, um, he didn't go through what was the major finding that the paper was fine, but what, what I found it really interesting was the paper actually showed that economic opportunity is an important factor in location choice of households, and especially households with religious belief in the West Banks are more sensitive to the housing costs. So those are um, not very, very um, ultra-orthodox type of people, but it's more like ideological group of people. They are the most sensitive group uh, according to his estimation. So the contribution of this paper is first, this is very unknown um, setting where, um, however, still the Israel settlement of the West Bank is a crucial global issue. So I needed to um, admit that during my PhD years, I'm, I'm graduating next year, and then I forgot about this global issue because I'm only focusing on this identification or very, very small minor things that PhD students are usually focusing on. Um, I haven't catched up with what was going on out, out in the world. So for me, it was very refreshing and then um, made me think that, oh, that's why I wanted to do PhD in, in economics because I care about the social issue. And then this, this paper is exactly targeting um, um, and then inform us about what's going on in the um, West Bank settlements. Um, and then also in terms of the lit um, literature contribution, the impact of belief on the responsiveness to economic incentives is important, but we still don't know um, exactly, um, or broad, not many people, pa papers are broadly studying um, the impact of this belief on the responsiveness to the economic incentives. Um, 
Moreover, limited studies in the urban economics literature investigate how different beliefs affects the location choice. So when there is a different uh, housing prices across locations, who are most sensitive um, groups to the shock is understudied in the literature. So in terms of this, um, this paper is exactly answering this important question that the literature has been silent about. Uh, however, um, um, so as Professor Gabriel talked about, the identification strategy or identification is still under the construction. So I'm here, I'm trying to um, brainstorm with you by suggesting some doubts and then some suggestion that um, I was thinking that would be great to be included in his estimation. So because of the time limit, he didn't have um, time to go over the exact specification, but let me briefly walk, over, walk you through the, um, the main specification at the aggregate level. So on our left-hand side, we have the probability of the um, moving um, from the uh, origin I to destination J, and then the main variable of interest is this price ratio between a uh, location J and location I, the destination J and then the origin I. So the idea is if the price ratio between the two uh, let's say the price is cheaper, a lot che more cheaper in location J, then people will move more to more from location I to J. So this alpha three is expected to be negative. And then later he's exploiting by, ex uh, by exploiting this um, different type of interaction term, which is basically looking at the heterogeneity impact across different types of groups. So he is uh, trying to estimate this, what are the different impacts across different types of group, and especially in terms of the ideological differences. Um, here, obviously, what we might want to be careful about is this potential endogeneity. So we can expect that there exists omitted variable biases, such as uh, positive construction shock in the destination, the, the, the West Bank. Uh, which increase, let's say, the overall <laughs> influx of people to the destination, and that decreases the housing price in the uh, destination. Or um, in other way, reverse causality. As more people coming into I and J, so the price ratio between um, the I and J um, changes. So um, in his paper, how, how he's targeting um, this problem is by taking the lag variables, um, he's trying to see whether this price ratio changes has a causal impact on the probability of moving from I and J. However, um, I, I think we need to think that this is not enough to control for the uh, time persistent, under, unobservable for some reasons. So the reason why we are taking this lag variable in the literature as a IV or um, try to get the causal impact is under this assumption in the A that um, the shock what we are worrying is um, this unobservable heterogeneity at the at time t, which can affect both um, my explanatory variable as well as my outcome variable. Um, and then the idea of this having lag variable as a uh, identification strategy is we assume that there is no such a um, impact, direct impact of this unobservable shock at t minus one uh, to my outcome variable um, at t. Uh, however, um, if we really think about what could be the unobservable factor um, behind this shock, uh, it is pretty, there are, there might be, I don't know exactly, it depends on the context, but there might be a lot of factors which can be persistent over time. So let's say the construction shock happened at T minus one, uh, which is not um, unobserved at, um, with the data, then this will, have, uh, this will have an impact on the unobservable factor at, um, time t as well, which will um, kind of complicate the identification. So of course, I think, in, especially um, in, in this housing literature, it's really hard to have a clear identification, but it's really, um, it's important to think what could be the underlying uh, assumption behind this leg shock. So I would um, add, try to think more in, in this regards. And then the other thing that I wanted to suggest is introduce fixed effects. So I think this, um, I didn't, uh, this regression is really powerful as it has a lot of subscript, especially at the origin, destination, and then the time fixed effects. So um, what, this, what here, and then the, our main regression of, uh, main interest of the coefficient was this alpha three, 
uh, which is coming from this variation at the origin time, uh, destination and then the time. So what we can include here is we can include destination time specific fixed effects as well as origin time specific fixed effects as well as origin destination pair fixed effects. So what this capture and what, what are these fixed effects are doing um, is this, for example, destination time specific fixed effect can control for any potential endogeneity problem that is happening at the destination time level. So let's say, as I, for example, as I explained, if there is a construction shock um, at the destination level, then those kind of unobservable facts, so that's why if, if that's the reason why a lot of people were going into the destination J, then those destination um, time um, varying un unobservable factors could be captured by this um, fixed effects. And then the same logic for the origin time specific fixed effect, and then this origin destination pair fixed effect can control for, for example, because or origin I and destination J was very close, so naturally there are more people uh, shifting, um, moving from I and J, then that kind of uh, origin and destination pair specific pattern can be captured by this uh, fixed effects. Of course, introducing this fixed effect has a downside that uh, this colored um, estimators cannot be estimated. For, for, for example, in his paper, he was interested in whether, for example, um, the political stance of the origination, uh, here uh, colored as a red, has an impact on the probability of um, on the movings. Uh, and then he interprets those coefficients. However, introducing this co um, co fixed effects will wash out all these colored um, coded um, variables. However, I still think that maybe it will be interesting to, um, to see those um, estimation as Professor Gavir was doing and then see how this uh, alpha one and then the colored variables um, the magnitude and then the direction of those variable, but at the end, uh, in order to perfectly control for the uh, um, endogeneity, it will be nice to have final column at, uh, including all these fixed effects. And then secondly, the intuitions for the finding was a little uh, vague for me. So the results show that uh, the religious group, um, and then I think it varies by the specification, let's say, but let's say the uh, ideolo ide ideological group are more sensitive to price prices. But for me, it was a little bit counterintuitive that if these people are very religious people, and then they, if their location is more uh, binded, if they are think of this religious views in choosing their location, then why would this, these people are more um, price sensitive. So that was pretty unclear to me. So I was thinking that perhaps is this because the religious groups have worse socioeconomic status. So then it's not about the, their belief, but actually it's about their um, price sensitiveness for the poor. So uh, for the robustness check, I would include the, uh, another uh, interaction term, which is, uh, which is the interaction of this income variable, and then check whether the differential impacts across different groups still exist. And if it is still exists, then I think it will be really interesting findings. Um, and then, um, so for the other potential um, worries that I had was the settlement location. So if we see the data, um, then it looks like non-ideological group settlements and then the ideological group settlements were located in kind of different area, then there might be the selection into certain area. The reason why these settlements are located in certain area might be not totally random. That could um, potentially hamper the, this identification. For example, that uh, ideological settlements, what if they were located in a cheaper part of the West Bank for some reason. And then if what if the ideological groups were actually just moving into the West Bank area for their religious reason? Then it's not about uh, the price sensitivity, but it's about the selection into the location. So um, as I suggested before, the destination level fixed effects can control for this issues such as religious importance or distance to Jerusalem. So I think having those coefficients will have really um, will um, add some more credibility. And then finally, I think 
I will not go over like specifics of this aggregate versus the micro level at the hazard rate, but the two um, sets of regressions are the result are kind of not consistent. Some of the results are not consistent, but I guess it's um, because <coughs> still we are in the search of what is the right identification strategy. So I'm not going to go over the detail, but for example, um, one of the, the left hand side variable is at the aggregate level and then the right hand side variable is at the micro level. And it looks like, of course, I'm, compar I'm not comparing apple to apple, I'm comparing apple to banana because it's a <laughs> different set of regression. But what, is show what I was curious about is, is, for example, with the same um, simulation, let's say here the, the dotted line is the ideological group, and then here all again the dotted line is the ideological group. And then it looks like on our aggregate uh, estimation, they are reacting, of course, at a different rate, but almost same direction. Whereas in the, um, the micro um, level of the analysis, it looks like only this um, national religious group, ideological groups are reacting. And then like, um, um, if we go back to the previous table, then there still is some um, discrepancy between the two. But um, as I said, there's a search of uh, identification strategy. So um, maybe having some consistency can be a sanity check whether we are um, identifying it correctly. Final point, um, yeah, this is actually my question that how are the housing transaction data collected at the, um, at a settlement. So it, it, um, because, so I think the housing markets are different. So I was just curious about um, whether this transaction is happening um, the same in Israel and the West Bank. Yeah, that's all.